In this video, we'll be breaking down and analyzing SpaceX's Starship orbital launch attempt. We'll examine key moments during the flight, assess the damage to the launch site, discuss the positive and negative takeaways, and finally finish off by talking about what this test means for the future of Starship and when we can expect its next flight. Without further ado, let's get into the analysis. After the first sign of ignition, an entire 7 seconds pass until the hold down clamps retract and the fully integrated Starship and Super Heavy lift off for the first time. In that time, the 33 Raptor engines were lit in batches, perhaps to limit mechanical shock and to prevent a pressure drop in the propellant supply. In the moments before liftoff, the engines were likely running close to their minimum throttle setting, perhaps 50%, to assess their status before committing to launch. At liftoff, they throttle up to 90% and the hold down clamps retract, releasing Starship. We can see the effect of nearly doubling the thrust as the dust cloud intensifies and monstrous pieces of debris shoot alarmingly high. In this footage, though our view is impaired, we can briefly see at least two engines have already shut down. One of the center three and at least one in the outer ring, possibly its neighbor too. These may have been damaged by concrete debris or they may have been deliberately shut down for being out of spec before liftoff. Before Starship even cleared the tower, it started leaning away from it quite noticeably. I thought this was likely intentional since we know Elon and SpaceX were very concerned about damaging the launch mountain tower. It's worth noting though that the failed outer engine we saw earlier was in the rough direction of the initial lean and that the engine graphic shows its neighbor has indeed failed too. This must have contributed to the lean before the engines gimbal to correct for it. One good thing about engines shutting down is that it allows us to figure out a mapping between the engine graphic and the actual super heavy. The graphic is showing the engines as seen from below super heavy. This is the belly side where the heat shield is. This is the leeward side. That means that this is the left side and this is the right side. So as we mentioned, the graphic confirms that a third engine has failed very early on. At 29 seconds, the hydraulic power unit or HPU on the right side of Super Heavy explodes. Super Heavy has two HPUs fitted at its base, one on the left and one on the right. They are used to power the hydraulic thrust vector control system that moves the engines to steer the rocket. If you look very carefully, you can see that the HPU explosion is the first thing that happens. Immediately afterwards, an adjacent engine goes bright orange, an indication something is burning in the hot exhaust. This could be oil from the HPU or even engine guts. 10 seconds later, that engine becomes the fourth to shut down. Even though the HPU appeared to explode first, it seems more likely that the engine suffered a failure and subsequently critically damaged the HPU before totally destroying itself. In any case, Starship manages to remain stable on the single remaining HPU. Incidentally, the next Super Heavy, Booster 9, will make use of electric thrust vector control actuators, rather than this hydraulic system. At 1 minute and 2 seconds, we clearly see a fifth engine suddenly, yet undramatically, fail, and the engine graphic updates accordingly. Straight after that, some debris explodes from the region of the left HPU, but given that the rocket remains controlled for now, it can't be the HPU. If we look at Everyday Astronaut's awesome footage, we can see the precious HPU here. Flames develop between the engines and then the explosion happens, clearly around one of the outer engines. Debris falls into the exhaust of multiple of those engines, causing these bright flashes, but they all continue running. When the SpaceX stream shows the first clear view of the engines, we see that there is actually a sixth engine out that is not indicated on the graphic. At 1 minute and 18 seconds, we hear the call out for max Q, or maximum dynamic pressure. Max Q. This is later than the 55 seconds SpaceX's timeline predicted. With six engines shut down, this is unsurprising. Remember, 33 Raptors running at 90% throttle would generate over 6,800 tons of thrust. Even if the 27 Raptors still running were at 100% throttle, they would still only be generating about 6,200 tons of thrust, a shortfall of over 600 tons from the target. Regardless, the fact that Starship survives Max-Q is a major milestone. Soon after Max-Q, we see what looks like white smoke coming from the exhaust. But this is nothing to worry about. It's actually a giant contrail. Nearly half of the exhaust mass of the Raptor engines is water vapor. 
At this altitude, the air can't hold much moisture, so that water vapor condenses out and even freezes into ice crystals, creating this dramatic trail behind the rocket. At 1 minute and 41 seconds, the engine graphic indicates that another engine has shut down. Things start to get hairy after this, but we need to take a few steps back because there's actually a lot more going on. Switching to everyday astronauts footage and rewinding several seconds, we can see that another of the Center 3 engines dims and dies before that. This is never shown on the engine graphic. A few seconds after that, an outer engine also dies, as the graphic showed us. Interestingly, 10 seconds later, the graphic shows us that the last engine that shut down is now running again, which we can clearly see is not correct. Even more interesting, a few seconds later, the center engine that just shut down does appear to weakly light up and flicker. Then, that last outer engine that failed starts spitting out a lot of material, creating a bright orange exhaust. At this point, the thrust asymmetry has become quite severe due to so many engines failing on the same side. I suspect that what thrust vectoring capability remains is just not enough to compensate for this, and the rocket starts to tumble. It's also possible that the vehicle just lost all thrust vector control. On the SpaceX stream, we finally get our first onboard view, and you can see the bright fiery exhaust as Starship starts going nose down. This is one of the grid fins, and this is one of the lift points for the chopsticks. I'm sure this tumble was not the intentional stage separation flip for three reasons. First, the engines are still firing. Second, this is too early. Booster engine cutoff was planned for 2 minutes and 49 seconds, and separation 3 seconds after that. If anything, we would expect to see it later, since propellant use decreases with every engine that shuts down. And third, this tumble was downwards and to the right. I would expect the separation flip to rotate Starship upwards, as this animation shows. Of course, as this was all happening in real time, it wasn't obvious, and the webcast producers show us the split screen in preparation of capturing a beautiful stage separation that never comes. Instead, the onboard view that previously showed us space is now showing us C. Looking down, we can see the contrail in the distance below. We also see a puff of green flame coming from a raptor that's clearly past its retirement age. At 2 minutes and 49 seconds, curiously exactly on schedule despite everything that's happened, we hear the call out for booster engine cutoff. Booster engine cutoff. Even more curiously, Super Heavy's engines keep firing as the full stack tumbles towards its 39km apogee. I originally thought that we may just be seeing residual propellant burning off, but after a closer look, it's clear that the engines are burning brightly and there's a full-on exhaust plume. It seems that, for some reason, the engines just keep firing for over a minute after they were supposed to shut down. Most curious of all, after the vehicle lost control and the engines continued to fire, the flight termination system, or FTS, was not immediately activated. I want to believe that since Starship was still within the safety corridor, SpaceX wanted to see if separation would still occur so that they could try get some data on Starship ignition, even if it wouldn't make it much further than that. If so, that means separation also failed. That could be for many reasons. Perhaps the clamps that hold the two stages together are hydraulically powered and they were unable to release due to the loss of an HPU. Another interesting thing to notice is the visible shift inside the interstage when we compare this camera view before liftoff and near the end of the flight. This must be from compression or crumpling in the interstage that most likely happened during Max-Q. This may have damaged the stage separation mechanism. The mechanism also could have been damaged by the extreme stresses of the full stack tumbling at over 2000 km per hour. The final idea to consider about the activation of the FTS is something Scott Manley pointed out. It looks like the FTS was actually activated on Starship at 3 minutes and 10 seconds, and super heavy 2 seconds later, but it just punched holes in the tank without any ignition. Propellant leaks out for 47 seconds until, eventually, the pressure in the tanks has dropped enough that they lose their rigidity and the airstream rips them apart. If this is what happened, then it still means that SpaceX waited for over a minute after the rocket started tumbling to activate the FTS and destroy both stages, ending the first ever flight of an integrated Starship and Super Heavy. Speaking of destruction, here's some shots of the pad shortly after the launch. 
The concrete under the launch mount was absolutely decimated. Even the launch mount's foundation was exposed and damaged. Hopefully the launch mount didn't get gronked, whatever that means. The tower shielding took some damage, but it doesn't look too bad. The tank farm also took a few hits and will definitely need repairs with a leak in one of the LOX tanks. All this carnage makes it seem likely that debris caused damage to the vehicle at launch and led to at least some of the issues Starship encountered on its maiden flight. Now let's discuss what the takeaways from this test flight are, starting with the positives. First, the one and only objective was met. The rocket cleared the tower and did not blow up the launch pad. But besides that, the fundamental structural design of Super Heavy, if not Starship yet, has been validated. The most critical step in that was passing Max-Q, but also structurally surviving that tumble. And speaking of tumbling, this flight also proved that you can have massive flaps on the front end of your rocket and still maintain stability on ascent. Those are all important milestones. Another huge positive was that SpaceX was able to gather so much data from this many integrated Raptors firing in flight for so long. Lastly, the fact that despite debris damage, explosions and failing engines, Starship was still able to nearly make it to stage separation is an enormous accomplishment. I just know SpaceX is really pleased with getting that far on this first test flight. Now for the negatives, and there's only really one. Even though the pad damage was not worst case, it was significant. We may have been lucky that Starship didn't suffer more serious damage and fall back onto the pad. SpaceX can't have this happening after every launch. Elon did explain that a massive water-cooled steel plate to protect the concrete under the launch mount is already in development, but constructing that and finishing all the other repairs will take some time. Elon says it will be done in a month or two, but don't hold your breath, it's a lot of work. So what does this mean for the future of Starship and when can we expect the next launch? Well, most importantly, Starship could actually work. This ludicrous beast proved the concept and held together better than expected. With all the development to come, it will only get better and more reliable. However, I think we'd be lucky to see another flight in two months. I'm happy to be proven wrong, but you can probably double Elon's timeline. My prediction is four to six months until Starship takes to the skies again. But what do you think? Did I miss anything in my analysis? Did Starship get further than you expected or were you disappointed? When do you think Starship will be ready to launch again? While you're here, please give this video a like. I hate asking, but I wouldn't be doing it if the YouTube algorithm wasn't as addicted to likes as a 16 year old girl. I spent so much time on this video and your support will make sure people actually get to see it. If you made it to the end of the video, make sure to also subscribe so you don't miss my future Starship videos. In the meantime, you can check out my previous videos on the Starship suborbital test flights. Thanks for watching.